Hello, and welcome back to the Mechanochemistry Discussions. This seminar series is hosted by the Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry, or the CMCC. I'm Ashley Martini. The goal of the seminar series is to bring the community together. The seminars stream live on the third Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. Central. They are available both live and recorded later on YouTube. Please do check out our YouTube channel to see any of the previous speakers, some of whom are shown here. We also have an excellent slate of speakers already lined up for the upcoming months, and we hope that you'll join us for all of them. Before we get started, a quick thanks to Dr. James Batisse, the director of the CMCC, Jennifer Belsick, the center's administrative coordinator, and two students without whom the seminar couldn't happen, Quintarius Moore and Noah Sheehan. Thank you again for joining us. Please do follow us on Twitter and stay connected with us at the YouTube channel, Mechanochemistry Discussions. Really quickly, the seminar is being recorded. If you have questions, we encourage you to either post them in the YouTube cha chat, or you may email them to us at cmccdiscussions at gmail.com. Note that we do reserve the right to remove any questions that are inappropriate. Finally, Today's speaker, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Dana Friedman. Dr. Friedman received her undergraduate degree from Harvard and her PhD from University of California, Berkeley, where she studied magnetic anisotropy in molecules. As a postdoc at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, she explored two-dimensional magnetism and worked on geometric spin frustration in Kagome lattices and quantum spin liquids. After completing her postdoc research at MIT, Dr. Friedman joined Northwestern University as an assistant professor where she received tenure. She recently moved back to MIT as the F.G. Keyes Professor of Chemistry. Her laboratory's research focuses on applying inorganic, inorganic chemistry to adjust challenges in physics and has been recognized by awards including the ACS Award in Pure Chemistry, the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the Camille Dreyfus Teacher Scholar Award, and an NSF Career Award. Last but not least, Dr. Friedman is a fellow member of the Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry. Join me in welcoming Dr. Friedman. Hi, um, so thank you so much for inviting me to give a talk in this session. I'm gonna talk today about some of the magic of the element bismuth and what we can do to create new compounds. Um, this graphic actually comes from a review article that we wrote a couple of years ago. And if any of you are interested in reading more, um, I highly recommend digging into it. And if any of you are interested in the TV show Star Trek, preferably the next generation, there are a non-zero number of Star Trek jokes um, in this article, actually an embarrassingly large number. But uh, Star Trek jokes notwithstanding, let's talk about bismuth and how bismuth is amazing. So one thing that is really exciting to us is thinking about magnetism. And if we want to think about magnetism, let's go back to the very, very beginning and think about a magnetic moment. So a magnetic moment is comprised of two elements, spin and an orbital moment. And in lanthanides and in atoms that are effectively in outer space, the spin and the orbital moment come together and they make one large magnetic moment, J. And this combination of spin and orientation is both what makes uh, permanent magnets work and what makes a lot of the elements that we think of as magnetism uh, function. In fact, if you're thinking about a magnetic hysteresis, you can kind of think that the uh, vertical axis is dictated by spin, whereas the um, horizontal is dictated by the quantity of orbital angular momentum. And so because these are the two fundamental components of a magnet, what we wanted to ask is, is it possible to take those two components put them into separate elements and bring them together through a covalent interaction and reconstitute a total magnetic moment. This um, is effectively a way of thinking about how we can consider the elements of magnetism, how we can put the pieces together. And it also gets us into a space which is really not well described theoretically. Um, 
And this is a general theme where if you have something um, where you have two elements coming together, completely bringing the elements together can be described theoretically. Bringing one element and having the other as a tiny perturbation can be, be described really well theoretically, but that in-between regime is actually very difficult to describe. And so this is something to us exciting experimentally. Can we get into that regime, which is both difficult to understand and difficult to describe theoretically? And can we do it in a way that could potentially enable the synthesis of a new class of permanent magnets? So of course we're going to get back to bismuth. So how do we do this? Okay, well, um, you know, the first thing that we need is an element that contributes a lot of spin. And there we can think about a lot of elements. Iron probably is the first one that comes to mind. For orbital angular momentum, that's a little bit more difficult. What you want for an element that has a ton of orbital angular momentum is you want something really heavy. And that's because orbital angular momentum um, couples to spin as a relativistic phenomenon. And you can actually, you can think about the uh, dependence of the size of the nucleus. If instead of the natural picture where we think of effectively ourselves as the nucleus with the electrons orbiting around like the solar system, we push ourselves into the perspective of being the electron uh, like being the earth, right? And then we see the nucleus like the sun orbiting us. Now, as that nucleus charge gets bigger, you have a much larger orbiting charge and that larger orbiting charge contributes a larger orbital moment. And you can think about this just simply with your physics hand rules, right? You have a larger current going around and that's gonna give you a much larger orbital contribution. So if we want a ton of orbital angular momentum, we want something really heavy. Um, bismuth is nominally the heaviest element that's stable to radioactive decay. In reality, it decays in slightly longer than the age of the universe, but that's okay. We're just gonna say bismuth is the heaviest element that's stable to radioactive decay. And so I began by talking about magnets and how orbital angular momentum is essential for magnets. But orbital angular momentum isn't just important for magnets, it's important for a whole host of materials. Um, it is the key element in, for example, um, these topologically non-trivial ground states. It is um, important for all forms of spin transport. So if we can um, bring orbital angular momentum into the picture with bismuth by creating new compounds, we can potentially create new properties and create them in a controllable way where we're bringing elements together specifically. So, you know, functionally, can we perturb the magnetic properties of iron by adding in a chunk of orbital angular momentum that is bismuth? Can we perturb the properties of a conductor like copper by throwing a ton of bismuth at it? And this is something which, um, has been of interest to us for a long time, but also starts to border on emerging fields in the past couple of years, such as um, topological superconductors, which is a very hot emerging field and relates to this idea of bringing a conductor and an element with orbital angular momentum together. So how can we create these new materials? Now, simply put, if these materials existed, they would exist. The binary phase diagrams have been worked out for effectively a century. So if um, iron bismuth existed, it would be known. If copper bismuth existed, it would be known. To access these phases, we have to go beyond traditional solid state approaches of simply heating two elements together and push into metastable materials. Um, and just as a reminder, um, metastable doesn't mean unstable. Diamond is metastable, graphite is forever. And yet both of these materials persist for a relatively long amount of time. The uh, vector that's been most effective for us in terms of accessing these high pressure or these uh, new phases is high pressure. And using diamond anvil cells, we can access pressures that are comparable to the core of the earth, which is pretty amazing, uh, 360 gigapascals. Diamond anvil cells are also particularly awesome from a synthetic perspective because they're transparent. And so diamonds are super transparent, which means that you can watch the reaction take place and you can execute in situ measurements. So effectively we have this tiny handheld, this is a goniometer head for scale, synthetic vessel um, where we can use any in situ probe we want. You know, we can measure diffraction, Mussbauer, IR, Raman, um, uh, X-ray absorption, X-ray emission, 
anything that goes through a diamond is something that we can measure in situ, which is really powerful for solid state chemistry, which has traditionally been viewed as a black box technique. So today I'm going to tell you uh, a couple of stories. And since um, this talk is recorded, or actually is just on YouTube, I, I really struggled with this, to be honest, because I only like talking about the most recent things, and it felt most appropriate to talk about published results for a recorded talk. Um, so we're just going to take um, a tour of a couple of stories, and I'm going to talk first about making magnets and how we can use bismuth to perturb properties. Um, I'll give a brief discussion on how we can also use bismuth to create topologically non-trivial materials, um, but I, I won't talk about the most fun results in this area, and hopefully you'll have something to read about that in the near future. Um, and then I'll talk about how we can uh, push past some of these ideas and use theory to predict metastable phases. And then finally, I'll completely change gears and talk about how we can use pressure, not just as a vector to create new phases, but as a vector to uh, continuously perturb the properties of existing phases to gain physical property insight. So let's talk about some fun science. Um, so if we want to think about phases to make new materials, one way that we can start is by looking at the binary phase diagrams. And so this is um, a copper bismuth binary phase diagram. And what you can see here is that there are no vertical lines. A vertical line would be indicative of an existing phase. The other thing that you can note is that copper and bismuth are miscible, like uh, water and ethanol. And so they combine to make... Um, to make a liquid, right? And there's this large liquid phase. So when we were starting this project, we hypothesized that this would actually be a fertile area to produce new phases. Now, copper is a great um, element to go after in combination with bismuth because of the potential for interesting superconducting phases. Now, what we did is we explored, and so I, I should take a step back and say that we've changed phase diagrams now. Instead of, um, temperature versus composition, we now have temperature versus pressure. And we hypothesized that we would find new copper bismuth phases with pressure as bismuth changed between different structural phases. That as bismuth was undergoing structural transformations, these would be opportunities to form new phases. And so uh, again, an advertisement for diamond anvil cell synthesis. I mean, this is amazing. Where these um, colored uh, pathways are, this is where we continuously were able to probe with diffraction um, the process of synthesizing these materials. And so the different color schemes correspond to the powder diffraction patterns that I'm showing. And what you can see is, or maybe what you can't see, is that we identified uh, two new phases in this system. And we even identified a region of phase space uh, shown here in D and also correspondingly uh, the center a long line where we could transform one phase into another. And so with these data, we were able to identify two new phases, copper 11 bismuth seven, which was um, the first copper um, bismuth binary compound discovered and is this beautiful significant deviation of the canonical nickel arsenide structure type. Um, this particular structure, I believe, has never been seen, but solid state chemists have very strong thoughts about what it means to have a new structure. So we'll just say that this is a significant deviation from the canonical nickel arsenide structure type and features um, some very unusual motifs, such as these, um, these copper units, these trigonal bipyramidal copper units, um, which kind of... Um, look like the copper is segregating from the bismuth even within this structure. And that's a theme that we'll come back to a little bit. And then uh, the second phase that we isolated was this uh, copper bismuth one-to-one -one binary compound. And you can see that um, in both compounds, you have these uh, nominal channels of bismuth atoms where the bismuth lone pairs protrude into this space. Um, both of these compounds we think are pretty interesting. And I think that there's a lot of future work to be done with both of them that I won't talk about. 
but we can also say that we'll, we um, can scale up these phases. So we synthesized them in a diamond anvil cell, identified them, but a diamond anvil cell is a really small quantity. You're talking about a hundred micron uh, slab. But now that we know the formation conditions, which were approximately 5.6 GPA um, and uh, 1400 degrees, that we were able to take these compounds, put them into a multi-anvil press, compress uh, the copper and bismuth under the same conditions and synthesize pellets that I can hold in my hand, in a gloved hand. Let's be safe about everything, uh, quite literally. And so taking these compounds, we were able to acquire uh, resistivity data. And these resistivity data indicate that this copper, um, sorry, this is the copper 11 bismuth 7 compound, um, is indeed a superconductor. And so what we see here is that the resistivity um, suddenly, and this is, we'll start with the zero field data, the grain data, drops to zero. And where it drops to zero, we can see um, the complete absence of resistance indicating that it's a superconductor. Now the hallmark of superconductivity is that as you increase the applied magnetic field, the superconducting transition temperature moves to lower field. And the way you can think about this is superconductivity is mediated by Cooper pairs, which are pairs of two electrons. And so as you apply magnetic field, you're kind of forcing these two electrons to align not with each other, but with the magnetic field, thereby breaking the superconductivity. And so as you increase the external magnetic field, you create a competition with the superconductivity. Um, you make the Cooper pair formation less favorable, and therefore you push the transition temperature to lower um, and lower temperature. Uh, the bulk nature of this transition was also confirmed by heat capacity data. We confirmed the bulk nature of this transition by heat capacity data as well. Okay, so copper and bismuth are awesome, but this isn't a way to make a permanent magnet. Now, one of the key things that we were interested in and continue to be interested in is this idea of taking um, a magnetic material and a material that has orbital angular momentum, putting the two together and creating new interactions. So we decided to go after the iron bismuth binary system. So copper bismuth is like uh, water and ethanol. They're miscible. What you can see here is that iron and bismuth are like water and oil. They don't mix at all. Um, and so by, to access the copper bismuth system, we had to use pressures comparable to the core of the moon. To access iron bismuth, we had to use pressures comparable to the core of Mars which are much higher. So at about 36 uh, gigapascals, we were able to isolate the first iron bismuth binary compound. And here you can see the powder diffraction data. Um, and uh, this is um, the aluminum two copper structure type. And the thing that I wanna highlight is that to the best of our knowledge, this is the first iron bismuth bond in a solid state material. That is not a molecule, I wanna be clear. And, uh, true solid state material. And we believe that um, demonstrating a pathway to form this bond has a lot of broader implications, potentially in the field of creating new nictide superconductors. Um, I won't talk about preliminary magnetic data on this compound, but I'll just say that the theory calculations indicate that it should be a magnet. And hopefully also we'll have more exciting data on this at some point in the future. Uh, another approach that we can take in making new magnetic materials, it's really not a lot of fun to talk about things that are published. It's the unpublished things that are fun. Okay, enough with the digressions for now. Um, okay, so another area that we can think about is looking in a space where there are existing compounds. So this is the manganese bismuth um, binary phase diagram. And unlike uh, the iron bismuth and copper bismuth phase diagrams, you can see that there is an existing phase. And indeed, um, the second phase shown here is, is a little complicated and we're not gonna talk about it, um, but the one-to-one -one manganese bismuth is a very well-established phase, which is actually a permanent magnet and serves as a beautiful proof of concept that iron bismuth 
could be a very powerful permanent magnet. Manganese bismuth, the magnetic energy product, which is the figure of merit for a permanent magnet, is only one order of magnitude less than the commercial magnets that are used. And one thing that's worth noting with the commercial neodymium-based magnets that are used is that they're significantly optimized materials. The magnetic energy product of these materials is very different by about an order of magnitude than the initial discovery um, because there's a lot of magnetic domain wall engineering involved in them. So this is an area with a lot of potential, but we thought, okay, so there's one manganese bismuth phase that exists. Are there other phases and could they also be magnets? Um, because manganese bismuth has a lot of fun complications. So we, again, used high pressure in a diamond anvil cell and we're able to isolate this um, manganese bismuth phase, the MNBI2, which has the same structure type as the iron bismuth phase. And so that's all I'll say about this phase other than the theoretical calculations are um, indicative that this compound um, is also a permanent magnet. And so of course we're working on measuring that right now. So, okay, that's um, what I was going to say about permanent magnets. Let's just talk for three slides about how we can use the same approach to create topologically non-trivial materials. Um, now to talk about that, we're gonna have to take a shocking deviation and that's to talk not about bismuth, which is nominally the heaviest element stable to radioactive decay, but lead, which is actually the heaviest element that's stable to radioactive decay. And so lead offers a lot of the same properties of bismuth, um, but one fewer um, electron nuclear spin. And so that means that um, lead is going to have just a little bit less orbital angular momentum, but all of the same ideas apply. Another thing that's nice about lead is that it's actually relatively earth abundant, which is um, potentially very interesting. So we were looking at the uh, copper lead system to see if it might have similar properties. And we were able to synthesize uh, a new copper lead uh, intermetallic compound shown here. And the cool thing about this structure, there are two cool things about this structure. One is that you can actually view it as an amalgamation of the lead structure and the copper structure at the particular pressure of formation, which is about 16 GPA. And so you can see that you have this lead HCP phase and you can kind of imagine it expanding into this central uh, lead HCP structure. And these copper, um, these copper octahedra, which are inserted into this structure. And one reason we believe that the structure uh, has this form is that the electronegativities of copper and lead are almost identical. And we think that there's very little um, electron transfer between the two. So lead still contributes this gigantic amount of spin orbit coupling. And indeed calculations by um, our collaborator, James Rondinelli demonstrate that we observe these potential band crossings that could um, be indicative of topologically non-trivial behavior. And so this is something that we're really excited about and um, definitely interested in pursuing further. So we've accessed all of these new phases and we've done it effectively using chemical intuition, thinking about where the elements are in the periodic table and what we want to and what properties we want to access. But something that would really help us and would really expedite um, these searches and make it a little bit easier for the graduate students and postdocs involved is if we could predict at what pressure temperature combinations we'd access these phases. And so one thing, which of course was a pandemic innovation, um, is to use phase stability calculations, because even though we're accessing metastable phases, at the point of formation, they're close to or at thermodynamic stability. So another way to um, think about this is pressure is a thermodynamic variable. When we increase pressure to form phases, we're changing the thermodynamic landscape and we're making something that was a local minimum, not a global minimum, come down in energy. It doesn't have to come down in energy all the way to be the global minimum, simply to be synthetically accessible because we're also using temperature. Um, now, once we remove the pressure, 
when the phase persists, that's when we're definitely accessing a metastable regime because the thermodynamic landscape has changed. So we're effectively kinetically trapping these products. Now, can we use phase stability calculations? So um, what we have here is the molybdenum bismuth system. And so molybdenum um, is similar to, molybdenum bismuth is similar to iron in that you really don't see any mixing between the two phases. So um, Allison was able to use AIRS, which is a, comput uh, a computational method for structural prediction. And effectively you're mapping out phase space um, Sorry, I thought that was more animated, but okay, you're mapping out phase space and looking at a collection of different compositions and seeing where your minima are. And so you put a lot of particles in a box and see what phases end up being more stable is a short way of explaining it. And so Allison was able to identify that just above the point of stability, um, there was a molybdenum bismuth, there's a potential molybdenum bismuth phase. And she increased pressure in the calculations and determined that it should exist at about 40 GPA. Now you'll know each one of these dots represents a different calculation and you have to manually put in the different compositions. And so this is something that, um, you know, it would be hard to get the 11 to seven copper bismuth uh, combination, but it would be more straightforward to get the one to one copper bismuth combination. So there are certainly phases that you miss with this approach. But anyway, these are the calculated data and the calculated data suggests that this phase would be the same uh, aluminum to copper structure type that we've been talking about. So of course, after doing the calculations, we go into the lab and actually uh, do the experiments. And Allison, and these are again, powder diffraction patterns. And Allison was indeed able to synthesize uh, this new molybdenum bismuth phase, um, which we're really excited about. So we can use theory to predict some of these phases. Uh, now, I've talked a lot about how we can make new compounds using pressure. And there are other compounds we've synthesized in the lab, but I feel like if um, I keep just talking about different compounds, it becomes an uninteresting list of things and there isn't as much to teach you. So I'm actually gonna completely uh, change gears and talk about how we can use pressure, not just to synthesize materials, but to perturb their, their uh, electronic and physical properties. And I'm gonna warn you, the conclusion slide to this talk is, we think we did a cool thing, but we really have no idea. So the payoff will be not as gigantic, uh, but it's still awesome. Okay. Um, so magnetic frustration is really awesome and could have fantastic applications. Um, let's talk about what magnetic frustration is. Now, if you have two electrons, there are fundamentally two things that can happen. They can couple antiferromagnetically or ferromagnetically. And those are the two and only things that two electrons can do. Um, ferromagnetically spin up, spin up, antiferromagnetically, technically both spin up, spin down and uh, spin up, spin down, spin up at the same time but we'll ignore that. Um, now, if we have a triangle of antiferromagnetically coupled spins, you can immediately see that the competing interactions cannot be simultaneously satisfied. And the spins are um, frustrated. Uh, we can say that they're unhappy, but there is no way that we can draw the lines such that every interaction is favorable. Now, in an individual triangle, you'll have a distortion, much like a spin pyrals distortion in 1D, where you effectively go from an equilateral triangle to an isosceles triangle. If you create a full lattice of these spins, then there's actually no way uh, for the system to distort. And you have the potential for exotic ground states. Now, the nature of these ground states is different uh, depending on whether it is a classical spin or a quantum spin. And where that changes is a little bit um, interesting to discuss, but functionally something that's S equals five halves is too large to be quantum. Even though S equals five halves sounds small, it's like a baseball. And uh, S equals one half system is really quantum and it's like an electron. Well, indeed it is an electron. So if we want to observe collective ground states that have the potential for really exciting um, excitations, uh, we need something that's functionally quantum. So one system, which is a structurally perfect corner sharing uh, triangular lattice known as a Kagome lattice is jarosite. And jarosite continuing with our theme is a mineral found on both the earth and Mars. Um, 
And uh, in fact, the um, Mars rover had a backscattering Musbauer spectrometer on it and was able to characterize jerosite on Mars. And the reason having jerosite on Mars was interesting is because these hydroxide groups in jerosite are a potential indication that water existed on Mars at some point. Anyway. Um, so jerosite had features iron in this um, hydroxide ligand field, iron three plus. And so of course, iron three plus in a hydroxide ligand field is gonna be high spin, S equals five halves. Now, if, as shown here, at ambient pressure, I think we know where we're going. Now, if you can imagine applying pressure to iron, oops, to iron, you can imagine that you're increasing the ligand field overlap. And so you're increasing the octahedral splitting because you're, you're forcing um, these oxygen ligands to be better donors because you're pushing them closer. And so there's the potential to uh, have a pressure induced spin crossover transition where you go from the S equals five half state to the S equals one half state. Now, if you could do that, then just by applying pressure, you would have um, an S equals one half uh, Kagome lattice that you could measure. And this is a pretty elusive target. Determining whether you have uh, a so-called quantum spin liquid state on uh, S equals uh, one half Kagome lattice is an exciting area of science and one with a lot of controversy. So that, that would be really cool. Okay, so the first thing that we did was acquired a ton of powder diffraction data. And I'm showing this just because I think it looks so beautiful uh, and shows what you can do in a diamond anvil cell. This is a little intractable. So um, here are the fitting parameters. So fit to the same structure. Jerosite is really convenient because it crystallizes in space group 166, uh, which is um, a hexagonal space group. Um, it's actually rhombohedral, but it doesn't matter. Um, which has, um, there are very few structural parameters to play with. So it's very convenient because it's so high symmetry. Um, so looking at the change in lattice parameters, you can observe that there are two points at which we undergo some form of structural transition. And um, the first structural transition, we were able to probe using single crystal X-ray diffraction. And using single crystal X-ray diffraction, we observed that we have a significant contraction of the lattice. Um, the structure parameters are not, are potentially reasonable for an S equals one half state, but unfortunately the um, magnetic data do not bear that out. And we can see through X-ray emission spectroscopy that the ground state effectively remains unchanged. Now we can go up to higher pressure to probe that second transition. And we see a couple of interesting things. And the, the takeaway uh, point is the X-ray emission spectroscopy remains the same, which is a good probe of the local structure and is indicative that we do not undergo a spin crossover transition. However, um, the synchrotron Musbauer, and remember, our structure remains intact at, um, at these pressures. So the synchrotron Musbauer spectroscopy, which is a way to probe uh, the magnetic field, the local magnetic field, indicates a dramatic difference. So the quadrupole splitting um, changes, as you can see here, um, but the key point is that the magnetic order disappears at 55 GPA. And so jerosite in its ambient phase is antiferromagnetic and it's magnetically frustrated with um, a transition temperature of around 77 Kelvin, uh, which is a NAL temperature. And so, the mag and so it has um, magnetic order down to low temperature. Magnetic order, especially antiferromagnetic order should be relatively easy to probe. And we observe that in the Musbauer spectroscopy um, down to very low temperature. When we pass 55 GPA in accordance with the second transition that we observe structurally, the magnetic order simply disappears. This is the hallmark of a quantum spin liquid phase. Our theory collaborators believe that this could demonstrate the onset of a quantum spin liquid uh, transition and that there are two possibilities. One, um, a change to the S equals one half phase. Um, 
and the other is a complex structural ordering with two different competing magnetic pathways. But regardless, we have a Kagame lattice where we've eliminated the magnetic ordering transition, which is um, puts us into a very exciting and rare experimental space. And that's all I have um, about that. So potentially we created a spin liquid and that's also something that bears further investigation. Um, and I just wanna finish by thanking my students because they do everything. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to give this talk and for your attention. And yep, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedman. We have a few questions from the audience. First, how can we start to think about expanding these high pressure synthesis approaches to industrial scales? Um, yeah, so there are a few answers to that. Um, the first is uh, diamonds. And so diamonds are synthesized by the earth and mined in challenging ways. Um, and diamonds are synthesized at high pressure. Now, because diamonds are a valuable product, there are alternate synthetic approaches to access them that have been developed. Um, the primary one being chemical vapor deposition. So the first thing that I would say in terms of industrial is there are a lot of different approaches to make metastable materials, a lot of different processing approaches. Um, to make the specific classes of materials that we're looking at, I actually think that there are electro deposition techniques that would be most amenable to scaling up to industrial um, scales. But, um, but as has been demonstrated over and over again in the realm of metastable materials, if something has cool enough properties, it can be scaled up using a whole uh, host of techniques. And actually, this is my first of two talks today. At my second talk today, I'm going to be talking about how we can use alternate approaches, um, how high pressure is a really valuable way to identify something that's in a local minimum. And once we've identified that phase, can we use alternate approaches, which are amenable to industrial scale up to access it? Um, and so the broad answer is there is significant precedent for uh, creating metastable phases industrially. And it just depends um, what the nature of the phase is. Great, thank you. All right, here's another one. Um, the topo, top, oh my goodness, I can't even say this word. Topographically non-trivial sounded very exciting to me. Can you tell us more about how this is useful and interesting? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, okay, so, um, so the, the classic explanation of something that's topologically non-trivial is the, um, coffee cup donut, right? So like a coffee cup uh, that has a handle and a donut have the same topology because they both have a hole and you can smoothly transform one into another. Whereas a ball can't be smoothly transformed into a donut because you, you'd have to puncture it. And so topology effectively relates to the number of holes you have and gets into fun things like Mobius strips. Um, now, something which is so-called topologically non-trivial um, in the realm of uh, quantum materials, emergent materials, whatever you want to, condensed matter physics, whatever you want to call the field, um, is something where the band structure features uh, strange holes and crossings. And so, uh, effectively, the, the area which has been most um, studied is something where you would have uh, two bands that cross and then uh, a mixing element effectively forces the bands to, instead of crossing like this, be two cups, one above the other. Spin orbit coupling is an appropriate type of mixing. But effectively what that means is uh, your energy can't go down, it has to stay up here. So you effectively um, trap electrons either in the surface of a material or in the bulk of a material. And so you can have things like um, surface conduction that can only go in one direction. Uh, the quantum Hall effect is the first example of uh, such a material. So the quantum Hall effect has a lot of applications in spintronics and creating devices that um, don't have traditional um, losses to heat, for example. Um, there are two classes of applications for topologically non-trivial materials that are discussed. One is in the realm of building device architectures that don't have um, that are protected from 
uh, electric energy loss. Um, that's something that gets really into computer engineering and hardware, um, and I think has a lot of potential because there's there's development in this area since the quantum Hall effect was discovered decades ago. Um, the other area which is newer and more challenging is in the area of quantum information science, specifically quantum computation. And there, there's an idea that if you have a topologically protected state, uh, you could use it as um, a qubit, the core unit of a quantum computer. Now, the thing that would be valuable about this is if it's topologically protected, like if it's really trapped and can't be, and things don't interfere with it, then it can't be impacted by traditional sources of error. And so this is, um, this is something which would allow for uh, fault tolerant quantum computing. Um, the ways that you would do this um, are still very much in development. So you'd have to do something called braiding of different modes and that's something which is um, challenging. What I can say about the potential feasibility of fault tolerant quantum computing is that Microsoft has invested very heavily in this area. Uh, unfortunately, not in me, but um, they've invested very heavily in this area. So at least one major company believes that um, topologically protected quantum computing is the way of the future. All right, great. Let's, uh, let's do one more question. For binary compounds with bismuth, how do you choose which transition metals to try? And how long does it take to study one binary material before you decide whether it's promising or not? This is a great question, and I kind of wonder if it's from one of my students, uh, especially the second part. But anyway, um, so, okay, how do we, I'm kidding, uh, my students wouldn't ask that. Um, okay, so how do we choose? So with iron and bismuth, right, this is really motivated by this idea of can we separate a magnetic moment and bring together these two components to reconstitute a magnetic moment. Same with manganese and bismuth, um, and same with um, some other elements that I haven't discussed here. Um, with copper and bismuth, we're looking for topological superconductors, and the copper bismuth one-to-one -one, uh, phase has some significant potential in that area. But synthesizing a sample that's amenable to characterization for topological superconductivity is not trivial because there are certain um, purity requirements. Um, you know, expanding beyond that, anything where we can come up with a fundamental question is the space that we want to be in. And so if, for example, we wanted to take um, a lanthanide and bismuth and think about how a localized magnetic moment interacted with um, the band structure of bismuth and wanted to look for things like the condo effect, that would be an approach um, to it. It's, I, I mean, the simple answer is if we have a scientific question that can be addressed by combining two elements, then we go after it. And the scientific questions don't necessarily have a theme, um, but there, there are a lot of questions within this area that can be addressed by creating new binary compounds and studying their formation. The questions don't even have to be physical in nature. For example, we can think about how lone pairs in bismuth would um, respond to an early transition metal versus a late transition metal and how the band filling would impact effectively the hybridization of bismuth. Uh, so if there's a question, uh, we get excited about answering it. How long does it take to study a compound? Um, it varies wildly, um, like with any scientific project. I, I don't have a good answer for that. All right, excellent. Thank you again, Dr. Friedman, for that excellent presentation. We appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was great to get to talk to you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Friedman, for that outstanding presentation. And thank you for joining us. If you missed any of them, I strongly encourage you to check out all the previous speakers on the YouTube channel. And we look forward to having you join us for all of the upcoming speakers as part of the Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry's Mechanochemistry Discussions.